Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. As our attendees trickle on in, we will begin gently with the first two or three minutes of casual conversation as people join into Webinar Jam. Webinar Jam is a pretty unique format. And so as we're here to as we are here to hear about asset protection and some of the fantastic pieces of advice that Michelle Fishbein can offer us, we will begin in just a couple of moments. So we're thrilled you're here. And Michelle, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Oh my goodness, my pleasure. I'm so happy that you invited me here. I know that you and I have known each other for a few years now, and uh, I'm so glad I can join you and your listeners and hopefully educate and inspire people in their journey. Yep. Equally with the with the asset protection focus, I think you you start to see some of the holes that people have in their own entity structure, in their vision about where they're going with their wealth building and wealth preserving journey. And so I, I know when I first started learning these concepts and subjects in 2021, I realized, wow, this this moves a a whole lifetime of learning right to the forefront because anyone who begins learning that you can't unlearn what you learn in these types of webinars. And so it, it puts you on a higher calling for your, mm -hmm. your own assets and how you protect them. So yes, for all the attendees thrilled you are here and thrilled to be able to share some of what Michelle knows with you. So we've got just a little bit more time before we'll begin in earnest. And then I'll, I'll just share a little about Michelle and what we'll cover tonight for anyone who has their hands free to be able to type in the chat, share with us a little bit. Are you coming to learn about the, the industrial strength asset protection? Are you coming to learn more about how this fits in with your estate? Tell us just a little about what you'd like to learn this evening. I'll ask some other questions as we go as well, but type in the chat or in the Q and A, if you already have a question, but share a little with us. What did you come to learn? I know Michelle is a wealth of information on both, <laughs> asset protection and estate planning. And so both those subjects weave together very nicely as as you will find out. So share a little with us in the chat. And Michelle, tell us how you got into the industry before we begin fully. Yes. Yeah, so I actually started my legal career doing business law, transactional law, and helping entrepreneurs set up entities and write agreements and those kind of things. And I found that there was so much that I needed to learn in terms of the tax consequences and some of the things we need to do beyond just entities to protect ourselves. Um, unfortunately, you know, the United States is great a legal system as we have. We do also have 94% of the world's lawsuits. So I really wanted to delve into those things and understand them in a better, in a better way. And so I went back and got my master's in tax law law school and was able to enter the world of estate planning. So I really enjoy that part of what I do. I get to know lots of families and the intricacies and um, their relationships. And then also many of my clients are entrepreneurs and property owners. So I help them with their business side as well as, you know, the estate planning side and meld the two. Uh, in terms of being able to protect the wealth that they're growing from potential lawsuits, which are more common than you can imagine. Well, Michelle, as a practicing attorney, has got a full presentation she'll share with us this evening. And so we will begin now. And I'll start by saying that when it comes to the question of asset protection, it is always a matter of, are you doing enough to mitigate all of the various trade-offs from the cost to protect your assets to the opportunities you have in the future. And that question of trade-offs is some of what we'll speak to tonight because every individual has to make that choice for themselves. Are they willing to continue to leave the door open for litigants to walk in, for plaintiffs to appeal either on the personal side or through your business and to start to separate out your risks to be able to remove some of the opportunities for plaintiffs to take advantage of assets left outside in the open is what asset protection is so good at. So with, with that in mind, let's go ahead and begin. And Michelle, if you'd like, I can share the slides so that sure. we can start right here. Excellent. All righty.
There we go. We okay, well, introducing myself, my name is Michelle Fishbein. I am an attorney at Trust Day and Associates here in California. We're in Northern San Diego County, for those of you who are familiar with the area. But we work with clients literally from all over the country and even internationally. So anyone from wherever you are, we're happy to answer your questions. Uh, if you'll notice the name Day and Trust Day, uh, Kevin Day uh, is one of the top two asset protection attorneys in the country. And so I'm so lucky to have him as my mentor. And we have a whole team to work with you in whatever capacity you might need. Our principal attorney is Elizabeth Trust, and I, I know Robbie knows her as well. She's very dynamic and an entrepreneur like many of you, it's many businesses. And uh, again, I've already mentioned Kevin Day, my mentor in the asset protection world. I also do asset protection. I also do estate planning and advanced estate planning and charitable planning if you need planning. I will help you. And then uh, I also work with my colleague, Johnny Nitty, is our expert in business planning. And then I also share the estate planning role with my colleague, McKenna. And we have also a wonderful team of support staff. So our goals today really are to be here for you. We want to help you, motivate you on your journey. So you work with Robbie on the various entrepreneurial pursuits that you have and then educate you about how to protect everything that you're building uh, from potential lawsuits and also uh, make sure that you have documents in place that can speak for you when you cannot either because you become incapacitated and then inevitably when we all pass away we can make sure our wealth is preserved for the next generation and then you know explain how we might be able to work with you as an, you know, everybody has a unique story and that's always such an important part of what I do. And uh, I really like to tailor our plans to fit your needs. So I can talk to you a little bit about the different ways we might do that. So we'll pause and issue a quick poll for those of us attending live. If you have your hands free, you should be able to see this poll appear on your screen so we can have a sense of where you're at in your asset protection journey. The the key feature being a trust, This we know that this type of webinar is not for the person who has no intention of owning assets, has no individual ambition for wealth generation or wealth preservation. If that is you and you say, I'm not interested in any of this, then it's likely that asset protection is not a fit. On the other hand, if you have a desire to maintain the wealth you've created or accrue more as you continue along in your business building or investment practices, this is where this type of information becomes very valuable. So about 50% of attendees have no current trust as part of their estate plan. 30% have a revocable trust and 10% have either an irrevocable or an asset protection trust. So great to know where people are currently sitting. We will trudge right along. Go ahead, Michelle. All right. Well, as I think I alluded to, you know, our our legal system is great in many, many ways. Uh, the one thing that I know can be problematic, though, is that we also have 94% of the world's lawsuits. We are a very litigious country. And so with that um, comes the need to protect yourself against things like that because honestly our legal system has turned into a bit of a lottery system especially here in california where it's very plaintiff friendly and uh, there's so many ways to come after people here and there's very plaintiff friendly judges so it's really important to start thinking about as i grow my wealth and start to um, bring wealth even into the next generation how do i make sure i protect everything i'm working so hard to to create. And so um, if you look at this slide, it just shows you some of the awards that go out to people. Uh, these, I believe, are all California cases. But you can see that when it comes to judges having a lot of discretion and juries having a lot of discretion in terms of 
what can be awarded to somebody. There's a lot of incentive for plaintiff's attorneys to come after all and anyone, right? Because many of them get paid out of what they win for their clients. I mean, you can see it a number, I think it's item two at the bottom there. And this is real. Um, somebody was uh, riding in a car accident and was injured on the freeway and had multiple injuries. And because he was a relatively young person, was awarded almost $60 million. It's not like you have to hit a busload of people anymore to, to find yourself in that kind of circumstance. So, uh, you know, sometimes we all think, well, I'm just gonna follow all the rules. I'm a really nice person. No one is gonna ever come after me because I'm doing everything the right way. And unfortunately, that is not the case. In fact, I had someone speak to me, they were selling their house and they had an open house and someone had come through and said, hey, I'm really, really interested in this. I want to sign the contract today. And I want a very short escrow. And so when they had the inspection, um, the woman had not been able to move out all of her stuff yet. And so she wanted to be there to make sure nothing was taken. And so this other person said, sued them for that and said that, the contract, you know, was ruined and they apparently had done this to like 10 or 11 other people and no one had stopped them. So you can do something as simple as just trying to sell your house and get scammed. So how, I don't know how many of you have ever been through a lawsuit. Hopefully no one. They're really awful. Uh, very, very stressful. But I thought it might be helpful for hopefully all of you who have never been through it to understand kind of the phases and how it works. So the first step is that let's say there's an incident that happens. Person goes to their lawyer and says, hey, I was injured and I want to go sue this person. So the attorney listens to all the facts and decides, hey, perhaps, you know, that we have a good case. But the next thing they do behind closed doors is they find out the de potential defendant what do they own and how much are they worth? Why do they do that? Because most litigation attorneys today get paid out of what they win. And it's part of the reason we have so much litigation, right? Because if you want to see someone, you don't necessarily have to pay all the costs up front. The attorney will take the risk for you. And they're, they're betting on the fact that if there's a lot of potential assets to go after, there'll be a big payday. So the more you have, the more risk you have for a lawsuit. So the next thing they do is they send you a nasty letter and say, hey, you know, this is what happened. And now you owe my client this amount. Then most people are like, no, I'm not paying that. And then they file a lawsuit and then. The next part of it is just really onerous and horrible to go through. It's called discovery and they can request all kinds of personal information about you and dig into virtually everything there is to know about you and your assets. And then most people at that point are just so stressed out. They haven't been able to work on their business or focus on anything else. They're ready to settle. But if you're really strong and you don't want to go that route and you go to trial, and potentially appeal. I mean, these things can take years. And then eventually there's the collection process. So that's all the things we get to look forward to. So <laughs> as I alluded to before, this is what an attorney does on the plaintiff's side. They try to listen to, hey, what's the story? Do we have good facts behind us? The next important part is what is there to go after? And then they decide if it's worth their while. Because at the end of the day, they may be getting 30 to 40% of whatever they win for their client. And so the name of the game, when we start thinking about asset protection, is to make everybody look like they're a very bad candidate for a lawsuit. So as you grow your wealth, our goal is to make it look like basically you're a pauper <laughs> because and we have all kinds of ways of doing that uh, because the less it looks, if it looks like you don't own much, 
then we can stop the lawsuit before it starts, before you have to go to the trouble of hiring a, de hiring a defense attorney, which is expensive. They don't charge in a contingent basis. They charge hourly, and those bills rack up very quickly. So these are the ways that people can come after you. So you may have your assets. I know some, uh, about a third of you have a revocable living trust. Sometimes I get clients who'll call me and say, hey, I have a trust already. My assets are protected. And in the context of a revocable living trust, which is very important for estate planning, it does nothing to help you with asset protection. In terms of legal liability, you're still considered the owner of those assets. Um, so it doesn't help you when it comes to asset protection. And sometimes we think about, you know, maybe we have our entities, right? We'll have LLCs or corporations, and that can provide some protection if the uh, liability comes from inside that LLC. But if you're just driving down the road and you hit someone, that is a personal liability to you and Anything you own is potentially on the table for lawsuit purposes. So there are additional things that we can do to help you. What Michelle's describing here okay. is the the angles of attack, and we'll talk further about that in a moment. But when you start to realize the various exposures that exist for every single investment you make, you start to realize the liabilities seem to grow as the assets grow. And <laughs> Unfortunately, with what we do at Y Street, when we have investors approach us to make an investment, we can typically determine the level of their sophistication with asset protection the moment they indicate to us how they'll be investing. It can tell us, okay, are they aware enough to make the investment out of an LLC, which has some semblance of asset protection? Are they making it out of a revocable trust, which, as Michelle mentioned, does not have much asset protection, though it has some benefits to it? Are they making it out of, for example, the an asset protection trust? Are they making it out of more complex systems? And that starts to indicate to us how the person has experience with either the litigation side of things or the need to protect. And so there, these, these things become very obvious. Equally, when someone makes their investment out of their personal name, that also is a telling sign of needed education in this space. Make a really good point. So I think of asset protection a bit like a ladder. And the higher you go on the ladder, the more protective uh, the asset protection becomes. So on the lowest rung is something we all need, and that's liability insurance. So if we're running a business, if we have a car, we have a home, we have rentals, whatever it is we're doing, we all need liability insurance. And I always encourage clients to at least start there. Uh, you know, there are issues with liability insurance. There's always loopholes, right? So whenever you make a claim, they're always sort of talk to legal. And that just means, you know, is this something we can get out of paying? So that's what they're looking at. And then the other thing I often get questions about is what about umbrella insurance? And umbrella insurance is helpful to a degree, but unfortunately, the bigger the policy you have, the bigger target that you will have on your back for a lawsuit. So there's kind of a balance there. There's a certain amount that's good for peace of mind, but then over a certain amount, you're going to actually attract more lawsuits. So we want to be careful there. The next level up is what we call entity planning. And that's what I alluded to in the last slide. We can create business entities. And oftentimes you'll hear things like, limited liability companies or LLCs, or sometimes corporations or S corporations, things like that. These business entities are designed to silo risk. In other words, for each entity that has assets, if let's say you own a building that you rent out and there's an issue with a tenant and they go to see you. The only thing that they can go after, ostensibly, is are the assets inside that LLC. Again, as I alluded to earlier, uh, if the 
potential liability comes from outside that LLC, it won't be so protected there. Um, the other issue that sometimes crops up with business entities is that there's a lot of maintenance that has to go on, especially with corporations, right? You have to file, you know, certain things every year with the state agencies. You need to do resolutions and minutes and keep track of things. You have to be really careful about how you use business assets. I can't tell you how many times I've had clients take the company credit card and Oh, I'll just buy groceries this one time. Well, the more often you do that, or even just one time, guess what a plaintiff's attorney is going to do? They're not respecting that entity as something separate from them, and they're going to poke through it and come after you personally. So you have to be really careful. Uh, and then there's the next level, and this is something that I tend to focus on, which is more formal asset protection. And the goal of this kind of asset protection is again to stop a lawsuit before it even starts. And it involves a few different kinds of entities that include trusts and then underlying LLCs. And I'll kind of walk you through how it all works and how it can help prevent a lawsuit, hopefully, before it starts. Michelle, to ask a question about mm -hmm. each of these rungs for liability mm -hmm. insurance, that means both liability insurance for the personal side, such as what Umbrella offers and mm -hmm. general liability for whatever companies or customer facing assets you may have. You're describing on both sides of, of the personal and business side. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? That is absolutely true. And one other thing that I failed to mention is that if a plaintiff ever alleges any kind of fraud, the insurance company, no insurance company, and no insurance policy will ever cover you for that. So that is also another tactic that sometimes plaintiff's attorneys will use because uh, that is another way to stress you out as a potential defendant. That is their goal, by the way, is to inflict as much emotional pain as possible because that will encourage you to come to the settlement table with a bigger number just to get rid of this thing off your back. To ask about the entity planning side, or maybe this is mm -hmm. a comment, but when an individual has got entities, whether they're holding companies, holding assets, or whether they're active businesses doing, you know, pursuing opportunities in the marketplace, mm -hmm. there are areas like phone calls, personal, personal versus business vehicles. Uh, you mentioned commingling of funds. All of those are mm -hmm. areas, if not carefully managed, where the entity planning can fall apart because an individual will be able to pierce the corporate veil. Is that correct? Yes, that is absolutely true. So it's important that your corporate compliance is done well and that you're managing your entity appropriately and truly treating it as an entity that is separate from you, that it just conducts business and that your personal life is personal. And one last piece of that is often mm -hmm. when people are signing on behalf of their business, even keeping the corporate formalities in your signature mm -hmm. as authorized member of blank LLC for and on behalf of blank LLC is an, is a corporate formality that can protect when doing business and saying, yes, that was me as my, as the manager of the business, not as a personal individual, therefore preserving that corporate veil. That's right. That's a really good point. And sometimes, you know, as we're working on transactions in the bigger picture, it's those little details that can make all the difference. Shall we keep going? We can keep going. So here, I don't know if you can do it from your computer, but we have um, a kind of risk assessment that you can take. And I believe that QR code should work. But um, if not, we can, you know, if you want to contact us individually, we'll be happy to email you something similar if you want to assess your risk. And it kind of will just kind of walk you through, you know, what are you doing? What do you have? And then you can see for yourself, you know, where are the holes? What are the things you need to do? And again, um, so really, when we're talking about formal asset protection, what we're really talking about is using uh, a way to remove technical and legal ownership away from you. Because the best way to protect yourself is that if you don't own something, no one can sue you for it, right? So if I get into a car accident, no one's going to come after Robbie's assets because I don't own them. 
So there's two ultimate owners of anything in our legal world, and that's going to be all of us as individuals or a particular kind of trust. It's an irrevocable trust. And that can be treated as an owner separate from you so that whatever it owns, you don't. And if you don't own it, then no one can come after it. So there's different strategies that we employ uh, depending on where you're at, you know, if your legal sees are calm or not. So I like it when people are able to plan ahead of time before any kind of liability arises, but that doesn't always happen. But if you're pre-liability, in other words, your legal seas are calm uh, and nothing is bubbling to the surface for you, then we can create these trusts in a variety of jurisdictions. So the way that formal asset protection actually got started for U.S. people was back in the late 80s. We, are, we signed the Hague Convention, and that allowed us to import foreign law. Uh, prior to that, the only thing that we had at our disposal as U.S. people was item one on this slide, which is to give it away. We would create a trust and give it to our children, our grandchildren, people that we care about. The trust would be the owner. Uh, our kids and grandkids would be the beneficiaries. And as long as the trust owned it, no one was at risk for losing those assets. And that was all we could do. And then we signed the Hague Convention, which allowed us to do things that people all over the world were already doing it, and which is to create a trust for our own benefit. We could be the beneficiaries. We didn't just have to give it away to our kids or grandkids or friends. We could actually still enjoy the assets. And we could import foreign law in order to do that. We, at that time, we had no law in the books here domestically, and that's where you hear about offshore asset protection. It means we are taking advantage of the law in a foreign country to be able to protect our assets, and that's still the gold standard when it comes to asset protection uh, for many, many reasons, but primarily because if anyone ever wants to attack that kind of protection, they have no access to U.S. courts. They are forced to go abroad, and that means hiring an attorney in that jurisdiction. Many times, uh, legal systems in other jurisdictions operate very differently. Um, you, as a plaintiff, actually have to put up a bond in order to open the courtroom door. In certain jurisdictions, that can be pretty expensive, sometimes like $150,000, and then another $50,000 to hire that attorney overseas so just to open the door and this is before you do anything it can cost a potential plaintiff two hundred thousand dollars which is probably why other countries don't see as many lawsuits as we do so it's still the gold standard but shortly after we signed the Hague Convention certain states started to sort of think about creating their own law and I think Alaska was the first one uh, to mimic some of the law that we were seeing overseas to allow people to create trusts here in the states and still be beneficiaries of those trusts and enjoy asset protection. And so now we have maybe 16, 17 states or so that have these laws on the books. I would say maybe six or seven of them are halfway decent. And of those, I would say Nevada is right at the top and right next door to our state they have excellent privacy and very short statutes of limitations and statute limitations are these little windows that you know people can crack through to try to unwind this structure um, but the shorter the better now there are people who do call me and say hey i'm in the middle of a lawsuit what can you do to protect me uh there a little bit of it depends on how big of a lawsuit is it? Is it gonna swallow up all your assets potentially? Then there's not much I can do to protect those assets. What I can do is to create a trust that somebody else starts for you, kind of seeds it with a little bit of money that you can use to rebuild. And anything that's in that trust would be protected in the future. 
the other piece of it is if it's a smaller lawsuit, I can't protect against that particular one, but anything else that's outside of it, I can certainly protect for the future as well. Anyone have questions about that? <laughs> we'll start getting into okay. some diagrams of what of what you can see once you start to analyze the lines of liability and where people should start to place trust so if you have questions please throw them into the chat now but a comment on something that Kevin Day taught me years ago was that the reason for a for a, a a person to pay attention to an international asset protection trust is because for a US investor you can get very excited about domestic asset protection trusts, but the highest law of the land in that context is the U.S. Constitution. And most U.S. investors are familiar with that concept. But the Constitution is superseded by international treaty and mm -hmm. the rights of Americans to access offshore asset protection trusts is governed by international treaty, which is higher than the U.S. Constitution. And I, I still remember learning that and realizing that is that is of benefit to me as someone who is accruing assets. It is. It absolutely is. And it's that's why we call it the bulletproof protection. Offshore asset protection is bulletproof. Uh, you know, but just like anything, the gold standard is going to cost a little bit more. And it may not be for everybody. There are intermediate things that we can do domestically that can be effective as well. Um, but like you said, because it's treaty law and above even federal law, it's it's very, very protected. So this is a diagram of a potential asset protection structure. And I like to sort of think about it like I'm the software engineer that describes how your antivirus protection is going to work. But when you actually use it, it's pretty simple. But if you looked at a diagram of how it worked, it looks kind of complicated. So bear with me. I will explain everything to you. So as I mentioned, really, the key to asset protection is to not own anything, right? Own nothing. But most people also want to control everything, right? You don't want to have to go call up some trustee somewhere and say, hey, pretty please, can I have some of my assets to go on vacation or invest in a new investment in Robbie or whatever it is that you want to do. So you want to maintain control. You built your assets. You know what you're doing. You want to continue on that path. So this structure allows you to have the best of both worlds. You can not own anything and still control everything else, everything in this structure. And the way we do that is that we use the trust. So if you look at the line down the middle in that diagram, that's kind of like your firewall. OK, and everything to the right of that line is going to be your asset protection structure. And everything to the left of that line is going to be your normal life. It's almost like your software and the right size, your antivirus software. So I use triangles for trust. So when you see that triangle at the top on the right hand side, that's your asset protection trust. That's an irrevocable trust. And whatever it owns, remember, you do not. But underneath it is going to be an entity, a business entity, usually an LLC. Um, and the reason we love LLCs is because it's unique. We can divide up ownership from control. So you trust can be the owner of the LLC, but each of you can be the managers of the LLC. And the, as manager of the LLC, you can do anything you want. You have total control over every asset that's in that LLC, but technically and legally, you don't own the asset. So remember, if you don't own it, no one can sue you for it. So there are certain assets we put into the structure on the right and certain assets we purposefully leave out, but we use the structure on the right to draw all the value off the table for lawsuits. So if you don't mind, I'll take one just a minute or two to kind of explain that concept. Um, in asset protection, we have the thought of you don't put all your eggs in one basket, right? So on the right-hand side, we put things 
there that maintain the privacy and integrity of your asset protection structure. The jurisdictions that we choose, the type of entity that we choose, it's all designed to keep your wealth private so that no potential plaintiff's attorney needs to know about it. And so the way we keep it private is we put things in there that are not front facing. So we don't want to put anybody's consulting business in there or syndication business in there, or anything active that is associated with you. And we also want to keep your uh, high liability assets out of there. We want to keep it low or no risk assets. So I like to think about the assets that go in there as your nest egg, your personal nest egg. If you have passive investments, if you have uh, long-term savings, brokerage accounts, for those of you who like to do cryptocurrency can go in there. Others of you who like to do precious metals, that can all go in there as well. And that's your nest egg. It's private and it's protected. Things like real estate, uh, if you own it and you rent it back out, even your personal residence, any kind of active business, you know, especially ones where you have employees or ones that, you know, your name is on the line there. We want to keep those things outside of the structure. And that all can go in your estate planning trust, which is the one on the left hand side. It's kind of a rectangle in this case. Uh, it says revocable living trust, and that is important too because we don't want you know your assets to end up in some sort of court proceeding for conservatorship or probate down the road. But that's that will be protected on by the the structure on the right hand side. And how do we do that? We use that structure to draw value off the table for lawsuit purposes. One issue that we have, too, is when you have real estate, especially you cannot move dirt and every jurisdiction is going to have um, control over wherever the dirt is located. So if I have a rental property in California, California courts are always going to have jurisdiction over that property. And most plaintiff's attorneys really aren't interested in dealing with your tenants. What they want is the value. And that is the one thing that we can move from the left to the right side. We want as much as we can on that right side. And the way we go about doing that depends a little bit on what's on the left side. Sometimes um, if you have intellectual property because you have a trademark or you have investor lists or you have ways of doing business, we can use that intellectual property and put it into your privacy company and then either sell it or license it back out to your operating company. And in doing that, you know, intellectual property is worth whatever two people say it's worth. You know, <laughs> a swoosh just by itself means nothing, but on a pair of tennis shoes, it might mean something entirely different. So you can name your price and we can, you know, negotiate, we can make that agreement. Um, so expensive that it covers the value of everything that you own. You can, you know, if you do it as a sale and pursue it to a note, then we can use all the things on the left hand side as collateral for that note that you can personally guarantee. And in that way, we can put liens against all of your assets. And what does that do? It allows that plaintiff's attorney, when they start looking at you as a potential, you know, juicy conquest, they're going to say, you know what, there's nothing here to go after. Everything is pledged. And in first, you know, I'd be at the back of the line, even if I won this case, it's totally not worth it for me. I'm never going to see a dime out of this. So they're going to move on. Um, and we can do a similar thing if you don't have intellectual property. Uh, instead, we can take what's kind of like your piggy bank with all your nest egg assets in there and turn it into a lending bank. And it can issue either a hard money loan or a line of credit. And just like any bank, what's it want? Interest and security or collateral. So all of those assets on the left are going to be collateral for that loan. Again, we can put liens against everything. And again, you're going to look like a terrible candidate for a lawsuit. I know I'll, that was a lot. <laughs> I'll pause and say mm -hmm. that 
for three years I have been studying this structure and I finally started to understand it after the three years. So <laughs> if there are those of you who are sitting there and going, I see some triangles and squares, but <laughs> nothing else has stuck. The next time you view this, you will be much further ahead. Michelle, do you want to advance the slide or shall we continue talking about this subject? Uh, you can advance it there. I think the next slide is just kind of a more, um, another option for more ultra high liability assets. Um, sometimes we'll put actual assets uh, in the structure itself and then lean them just to get them behind the firewall. Um, but that's not always for everybody. And so it just shows you another option that's available. So we'll ask another question in the poll here mm -hmm. to get a sense of your priorities as listeners. To understand a little about your current business landscape, the poll asks if you're running an active business, if you intend to run an active business, or if you are mostly in a passive investment space or perhaps in a retirement sphere where your liabilities are more confined, but still, as we learned from the early slides, not excluded. And you know, anytime you peek out the front door, there could be an attorney waiting there with some evidence for <laughs> Or a reason to run a lawsuit. So it looks like our our current respondents, people are actually still responding. So we'll we'll pause there for a second. But if people have questions for Michelle, this is a great time to start to place them in the chat. But I'll also ask them to help us back up and see the bigger picture again, given that there are steps to all of this. And Michelle, how would you describe the states and stages of going for gold standard asset protection? How how would the steps work? Yeah, so sometimes I talk to people and they'll say, you know, I'm not a billionaire. I don't think I qualify for any of this. And, you know, I often think back and I go, you know, if I had a million dollars and I was sued, you know, for less than $2 million, that million dollars is going to hurt me a lot more than a billionaire. So I think almost everybody could qualify. I mean, I've set up domestic structures for people who own just a coffee cart because you can't get enough insurance when people are putting things in their body, right? Or sometimes, you know, there are certain thresholds where people start to feel more comfortable with maybe an offshore jurisdiction um, just based on net worth. And that's usually around $4 million, but that isn't sort of the cutoff, all right? Everybody has a different situation and at different levels of wealth, it makes more sense. It all also has to do with the level of risk you're undertaking. You know, I might have someone who's worth a lot less than $4 million, but um, they're manufacturing weapons or I had another client who was renting out airplanes. So it made a lot more sense to do offshore at a lower threshold than maybe for somebody else who's, you know, retired and just wants to protect that nest egg. So we've got some great questions coming mm -hmm. in and it's probably great. good to start talking about them and then we'll we'll try and back up and make sure we can provide even greater vision for those who are just turning on to this type of asset protection structure. But when someone is beginning, you mentioned you begin with insurance, whether it's on the mm -hmm. personal side or on the business side, though you should have both. How do you know if you have too big of a liability umbrella? What could the guidance there look like? Yeah, so you mean how big of an umbrella policy do you think someone should have? You know, there's no hard and fast rule, but I always get a little nervous when I see those $5 million policies and up. Those are definitely attractive to a plaintiff's attorney. So uh, if you're getting there, we should really talk about doing something a little different that would kind of keep those plaintiff's attorneys off your doorstep. And to ask another audience question, mm -hmm. how does this overall strategy affect your net worth when you're either looking for loans for new investment or looking for accreditation status? How does this affect your your objectives when you're pursuing your personal financial goals? Very good question and one that does come across quite often. So uh, in terms of wanting to get third party financing let's say you just want to get a heloc on your house but you have this lien that you've put on it uh 
you are the manager of that LLC that put the lien on there. So guess what? You can remove it at any time. You can make whatever collateral you want available to a potential lender. Um, and then once the loan funds, if there's remaining equity, you can put the lien right back on for the remaining equity and it would be behind your third party lender. So these are all friendly liens. Nothing is, sometimes I get questions about, will this be reported to a credit agency? No, nope. no reporting needed. These are all friendly liens. This is not like you went out and got a loan from somebody else. Uh, and then in terms of a, having accreditation for an investment, there's a few ways that uh, people are able to continue doing that. And that is sometimes it's based on income. And the neat thing about the way we do our structures is that all of these entities from the revocable trust, the irrevocable trust, the underlying companies and so forth, everything is passed through. Uh, even though you are not the owner of the entity for lawsuit purposes on the right hand side, as everybody knows, the IRS has a totally different regime for determining ownership. So you may not be the legal owner, but you're still the tax owner. So all the income flows to you on your return. So your return really isn't going to change. Um, so if you need to show income, no problem there. If you're needing to show assets, sometimes people will do consolidated returns. You're still the beneficial owner of anything on the right hand side. So that counts. And to date, we've never had an issue with it. Very good. So we have over 50% of our attendees either owning an active business or intending to in the future. 40% mm -hmm. are roughly either not currently exposing themselves to new liabilities or they're, they're, they're stabilized in their current assets and, and not creating current business liabilities. Mm -hmm. So we'll ask one last pause. We have a couple of minutes left in our time this evening with Michelle to understand what we should focus on. We can either back way up and continue to view the overall landscape of asset protection, entity planning, and estate planning, or we can go for the gold standard and discuss the offshore components. And so I'll issue a poll in just a moment. So look on your screen and you can respond here. In just a moment, there you go. So give us a sense of what would be more helpful to this audience. Of course, we will share Michelle's QR code again so you can do some of her risk planning assessments, risk assessments that start to cover where your areas of exposure are. That QR code is on the screen. But Michelle, we have a very early lead in the poll on the <laughs> Offshore Asset Protection Trust. So it's okay. not people want to hear about the gold standard. Okay, well, I don't blame you, any of you, for that. So, this structure really does. You can go back to the prior slide, Robbie. Um, so, whatever we use as a jurisdiction for the trust won't necessarily change very much, in, won't change the rest of the structure that much. Um, the jurisdiction we choose is really designed to give you like that bulletproof protection. Um, and again, forcing any potential plaintiff to go to an outside of the country in order to attack the structure. So um, there are a variety of jurisdictions that offer this kind of planning and these kind of rules. Um, and, and so, you know, sometimes you'll hear about the Isle of Man. We really like that one. Um, Gibraltar is an excellent jurisdiction. They tend to be a little bit more on the expensive side. And in terms of sort of bang for your buck, I'm not sure that the actual increase is necessarily worth it. Um, I would say in terms of moderate price, but really great law, I would say the Cook Islands is probably the best out there. And it has excellent, excellent asset protection law, is more moderate price wise, and um, affords use a few things that are really special, which is that uh, one, it's a no tax jurisdiction. Two, uh, their statutes of limitations are extremely short. Remember that little crack in the window. So uh, it provides a two year overall statute of limitation. After two years, complete ban to lawsuits. 
but there is a one year effective statute of limitations. And what that means is that there's only one way anyone can attack any of these structures. And it's something called fraudulent conveyance. And it's a strange term because I don't think it really relates to what it means, but um, it's not fraud in the way that we normally think about it. You know, some late night guy hawking something that doesn't really work. This is more along the lines of, let's say you get into that car accident, you know that the injuries are way more than your policy is gonna cover. You're really worried about your assets being taken in a lawsuit, so you call up your cousin and you say, hey, I'm gonna put everything in your name until this whole thing blows over. That is a conveyance, because you transferred title, you transferred the ownership to someone else, and it's quote unquote fraudulent because you knew that you potentially owed those assets to a third party, to people that you hit. And so in the same vein, what people would claim is that you transferred your assets to this asset protection structure just to avoid paying them. And where that is important in terms of that one year statute of limitations, the standard of proof in the Cook Islands is so high in other words, they basically need a recording of you saying that and having that say, I'm never paying person A, I'm moving all my assets into my trust in the Cook Islands. That's never going to happen. So basically after only a year, this thing is basically bulletproof. And um, that's very short in litigation land. A year may sound like a long time, but when it comes to litigation, it's very, very short. So... so you mentioned yes. jurisdictions, and yes. if anyone's wondering where the Cook Islands mm -hmm. are, they are off in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And <laughs> Michelle, mm -hmm. in terms of making that selection, at what point, how, how does your office guide people in making these types of decisions, given that most of us may never travel to see the areas where our offshore asset protection trusts are located? Yeah. Well, one thing that guides these decisions, um, there are a variety of jurisdictions. Some of it is cost-based. Um, like Nevis has copied um, the Cook Islands law, but they've been around a, um, a, in a much shorter period of time. They don't have as much experience. I think they've been around for 10 or 15 years in this space, whereas the Cook Islands been over 30 years. Uh, all of their trustees are uh, attorneys. They're very well versed in the law and um, have proven records. They have billions under management. So there's no worry that, you know, anyone's going to abscond with your assets or anything like that. And the other piece of it is in terms of determining a jurisdiction, sometimes, you know, people may not be quite ready for something um, like the Cook Islands, but a more intermediate jurisdiction like Nevis might make more sense. Um, it just, like I said, it's, we need to speak to each client and hear your story. And then we really are able to make an assessment and work with you to figure out what is the best structure for you. It often depends on, you know, where you're at in your entrepreneurial journey, um, how much risk you have, what kinds of assets you have, how we're going to protect them and what makes sense for you. Again, it's a blend of risk and then value. We've got some other great questions, but I'll ask this while while we're sitting on this slide. There are th we know that to to create such a structure takes some significant time. It's a conscious effort required by the entrepreneur to communicate with trust and associates about their desires to make the right selections to begin to move assets. So it takes time, of course. To go offshore is a significant expense as well, but when you compare it to what you're protecting and the motives for protecting it, the, yep. the opportunity cost becomes a little bit more clear. How does it work in terms of legality? Often people hear offshore as a as a legal concern, as if there, mm -hmm. there may be some illegality to moving offshore. Tell us about that dynamic. Yes, so everything that we do we would feel very comfortable going in front of a judge and giving them all the details. Everything we do is legal. We are not trying to necessarily hide assets from the government or um, hide from the IRS or anything like that. In fact, 
there is one extra piece of reporting that is required when you go offshore, and it's an informational return to the IRS. It doesn't mean that you have to pay any extra taxes. It's just another form that you have to file, and it says, hey, IRS, just so you know, I have a trust. It is offshore, but I am still the taxpayer, so don't worry. You're still getting your funds. And part of that is actually very important for your file because unfortunately there have been times in the past where people have abused these things. So sometimes if there was a particularly litigious person who didn't care if they had to pay attorney hourly just to go after you, and let's say there was a lawsuit and the judge says, what is this offshore business? What are you trying to hide? you can pull out that form that goes to the IRS and says, hey, I'm not trying to hide anything. I'm even telling the IRS. And, you know, judges are just as afraid of the IRS as everybody else. <laughs> so they're going to say, hey, you know, if you're telling the IRS, we know that you're on the up and up. So it only helps you. And um, the other part of it is that because the trust companies are aware that these have been abused, they also do their due diligence. So they only... Uh, accept people um, once they're sure that nobody's trying to launder money or anything like that. So there's a little bit of due diligence that they do. So that's some extra paperwork that gets filled out when we do these kind of structures. But it's not too bad. We kind of have it down to a science. And if the IRS has a form for it, it's typically not illegal. Right. <laughs> so, so a question from Ian. He says mm -hmm. he has property in four countries other than the United States. Mm -hmm. Are those properties? either practically or from a legal basis, harder to go after from a U.S. lawsuit? Does international asset ownership make a difference in someone's exposure to liability? It does. So there's part of it is liability. There may be a judgment, but then there's enforcement, right? So how is a U.S. court going to get another country's court to comply with the judgment? Probably not. Um, is a plaintiff even go to go to the expense? Oftentimes that means you have to transfer the lawsuit to that jurisdiction and then deal with a foreign court. And because foreign laws are so different and the doors to open the courthouse are a little bit harder to open, um, generally people with foreign assets are in a better position. That isn't to say though that we can't protect those, but we have to work with counsel in those jurisdictions um, to work with them to see what's available in those jurisdictions. So is there a, is there a best practice in terms of how someone should with this information in hand mm -hmm. begin to explore their, their next steps? Yes. So we, as our firm, offer a free consultation, especially to your listeners. So we'd be more than happy if you'd like to reach out to us. I run our asset protection department and I'd be more than happy to talk to you about what's going on for each of you. And then we can explore together what makes sense for you. It, you know, you may not be at a point where you need an entire asset protection structure. We may be able to do it in phases. Um, you also may be at a point where you should have had one maybe years ago, but at least now you're aware of it and we can start putting things together to keep you safe. So again, it's very individualized. There's no hard and fast rule for anyone. So it's really important to just talk about, you know, what's going on for you, get those details, and then I can work with you to create something that works best. For everyone attending this webinar, mm -hmm. you must have some vision for your assets and for the person who desires to keep them for yourself that is where these structures that is where this information becomes of use if you if you appreciate what you've done your the work that has been represented by the assets you own that is where these trusts come into play to protect you so whether it's one million dollars a hundred million dollars of assets under management or things you own to be able to protect them is, is the role of an asset protection trust. So please follow up with Michelle and begin to understand a little about what more you can do to protect what you have earned and what you are working to accomplish. So Michelle, thank you so much for attending. And for everyone who's listening, please do reach out to your asset protection attorney so that you can 
begin to prepare for a better road with, with more protection in place. Thank you so much for having me and giving me this opportunity. And I look forward to hopefully hearing from some of you soon. It was a pleasure.